Hi, my name is Edward. Some of you know me. Um, I used to be an apprentice here actually many years ago, a design apprentice, believe it or not, and I'm now an independent developer in the area. Um, and I also uh, wrote a book for ThoughtBot, uh, Domain Name Sanity, um, buy 17 copies for your friends. That'd be great. Um, but we're not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about Dwarf Fortress. Um, I want to just show of hands how many people have heard of Dwarf Fortress? And how many people have played Dwarf Fortress? Two. Okay, yeah, that's about what I was expecting. It's like about maybe 10 people here. Most people have heard of it. Two people have played it. That's, I've run into that all the time. It's a very infamous game, perhaps. Um, and uh, it was started by two brothers in, in 2002, um, Tarn and Zach Adams. They live outside of Seattle. Um, they have been working on this for 14 years. It is more or less their, their biggest and only project at the moment. Um, it's, it's totally free. It's not open source, but it is totally free. Um, and the first public release was in 2006, so four years after they started developing it. It's a huge project for them. Um, and uh, they've developed this whole sort of fan community around it because it's this crazy game. Um, and uh, so I'm gonna hopefully, uh, this is not gonna be a tutorial, it's just gonna be sort of a, a brief, like this is sort of what the game is, so you maybe feel a little more comfortable playing it or checking it out um, if you're interested. Um, their motto, if, any, if anything, is, is losing is fun because the game is fo focused around just like these incredibly complex systems and it's impossible to know all of them, so you're just gonna go into it and you're gonna fail and you're gonna go into it and you're gonna fail and you're gonna go into it and you're gonna fail uh, and until finally you start succeeding more and more. More, and that's sort of fun. Um, I compare it a lot to like casual games, like you have something like a um, like a Candy Crush or whatever. That's a very casual game. You go, you have fun. It is served to you, and you have it. It's very plain and boring, but you know that's totally legitimate. Um, there are also like hardcore games, uh, like a Hyperlight Drifter or something like that, where you're you're sort of more beaten over the head with this fun, and that's uh, sort of overcoming that challenge is is part of the fun of that game. With Dwarf Fortress, it's a little different. Like I said, you're you're facing all these crazy enemies, you're facing yourself in some cases, um, and you lose and you try again, you lose and you try again, and you lose and you try again, until finally, you know, like the metaphorical dragon comes and eats you whole, but you stab at its stomach and you kill it and you've avenged your, your fort um, and you rip from its heart the fun, and that is fun in Dwarf Fortress. Um, <laughs> And that is definitely what it feels like to, to play the game. Um, I compare it a lot to sort of a mix between like a Minecraft and like a real-time strategy game, like a StarCraft or a Age of Empires or something like that. Um, it's uh, the Minecraft part is that it's it's totally open-ended. It's it's procedurally generated world, so they generate this massive world for you to play, like in one little tiny part of it, um, and histories and important figures and everything. Uh, and it, just like Minecraft, also there's a very open-ended gameplay like there's no one correct way like you, you don't you're not going through a story you're not trying to like beat a particular thing or do a particular thing it's just up to you what you want to do um the, the starcraft or real-time strategy stuff kind of comes in because uh, you're you're not like minecraft you're, you're not a particular entity in the game you're not one dwarf or one character you're this overarching god if you will that is controlling buildings and units and management and and just trying to coordinate everything that's going on um so um, another amazing part about Dwarf Fortress, don't bother trying to read this, it's just a, a text from a, a website that, that sort of catalogs people's experiences with the game and they write them up as sort of these like fictional stories um, from what has actually happened in their game. And this is a crazy story about like this dwarf that uh, um, was born during a few years into the fortress. His mother was the mayor of the, of the fortress and he grew to be this legendary axe. Uh, axe dwarf and this goblin attack came and killed his mother so to avenge his mother he built up this crazy fortress and with all these innumerable traps and the the goblins came and attacked and got through but most of them died in the traps and he sort of took care of the rest of them and uh, took almost no damage except for this little like scratch on his arm a couple years later that scratch turned into a crazy infection and he was just overtaken by evil and eventually like locked down the entire fortress and killed his entire fort um, so that is one way to to have fun in this game. Um, but there are tons and tons of stories like this, and they're, they're cataloged if you go to dfstories.com, and I'll have that on the slide later. Um, but I'm going to take you out of this and actually uh, go into the game a little bit. 
Um, so this is more or less what the game looks like. Uh, you may have heard it is completely ASCII text, and this is mostly ASCII text. I do have a skin on this, so you're not looking at the default, but it's pretty close, actually. Um, and uh, it looks pretty intimidating at first, and you may think you have to know like what every little square does, but it's totally not the case. Like you can kind of tell like there's some water over here. Um, you can kind of tell there's maybe, I don't know what's over here. There's some grass or whatever. So I'm gonna take a look and so like this is dense bubble bulb, and this is dense downy grass, and this is open space. It's just you know a river or whatever. This is a downward slope to that that river and this is some wood logs up over here so I don't actually need to know every single little bit of what's going on you kind of get a sense for what's going on because you spend so much time with it after a while like just I've seen this screen a billion times and what you're looking at here is a an overhead view, X and Y are as normal, but uh, the you can sort of move through the Z layers. Um, so I can go down into the earth and down one more and up and up and up, and you can actually see there's like trees up here, and I'm now I'm just out up in open space, and I can go back down to the ground level. Um, and it is, uh, one second, so if I, um, you can, you can start in all sorts of different environments. Um, you, oops, sorry. Um, you can start in environments that are, why does it keep doing that, what am I doing? Um, you can start in environments that are like totally icy or desert. This is more of a foresty environment. Like I said, it generates this huge procedural world for you to, for you to sort of play in. Um, and I can show that too. So here's the world it generated. Um, and I'm in one square right in here, and each, each square is, let's see if I can get this a little bigger. So each one of these squares takes up this amount of space right here, which is a 16 by 16 grid, and I am playing in a 6 by 6 area in this 16 by 16 grid to give you a sense of the scope of the world. So again, it's... Um, it's this big, this is the whole world. I'm in one six by six area that is a 16 by 16 square of one of these squares. This is massive, totally massive. Um, and the, the, the play really comes from um, managing a lot of dwarves. So I'm gonna go down a little bit into the earth where I've dug. Um, there's a bunch of, there's some dwarves right over there. Um, and go down one more layer and you can see a bunch of my workshops. So I have like a craft dwarfs workshop up at the top right and like a mason's workshop and a jewelry station and a fishery and a kitchen and a whole bunch of other things. And I'm, I have dwarfs that are assigned certain laborers that go do things like they will, you know, cut out gems or they will go mine stone or whatever it is that I need them to do to, you know, do whatever I want to do. I can go build a huge fortress with tons of traps. I can go delve down into the earth to find natural caverns and fight beasts and fend off attackers and et cetera, et cetera. Um, these are all of the dwarfs that I have right now. More come all the time. Um, and you keep adding and adding to this list and it can be hundreds and hundreds of dwarves long. Um, so they all each have sort of a, a main job, but you, they can do all sorts of things. Like every dwarf by default can just like haul things around. So if you need something moved from A to B, they can just do that and you can enable and disable all those things. Um, so as you can see, it gets incredibly complicated, um, but the level of procedural generation is just nuts. So if I like want to go, let's look at this engraver. Um, so I'm going to hit V to go to that unit, and then I'm going to hit Enter to look at its thoughts and preferences. So this is the individual thoughts of this particular dwarf, um, and you can use this to sort of also guide the gameplay a little bit. Um, usually it'll say something like, uh, they were super exasperated when caught in the rain, so you need to make sure maybe this dwarf doesn't want to be outside a ton. Or it might say it was they were annoyed when they had to, you know, drink alcohol without a mug or some kind of cup. So like, oh, I need to go build cups or whatever. Um, you can use that to kind of to drive some of the play. And this is like it's on a, like this obviously super micro level of of detail, but also goes out to the totally macro level of detail. Um, every world, like I said, totally, not just procedurally generated land, but procedurally generated like um, civilizations and units and wars between those units. They can look at like the wars between each, each faction throughout the years and every year has a certain amount of events. I can look and look at, um, 
uh, what was it? Yeah, historical figures, which actually takes quite a while to load because there are just thousands upon thousands. And you can see the scroll bar at the top right of how many I'm going through here. So if I click on any particular one of these, you can actually get a family tree from where they, it just, this is just totally, totally nuts. Um, and this, you just, like again, you're just in this tiny little square of, of this massive, massive world. Um, and you can abandon your fortress and you're like, you know what? Everyone's vampires now, I'm done. I'm gonna just hop over to this other section um, and start again and maybe some of that can come and interact because um, you're actually only ever playing uh, with one uh, one place at one time. Um, so, yeah, I'm trying to think what else I can go over. Oh, there's also just like massive amounts of, of like items I can have. So let me just look at the stocks here. So, for example, it gives me sort of a rough idea. Like I have this much meat or fish or plant because that's some like essentials that my dwarves need to like survive. Um, but... Uh, another example of some of the jobs, I have a, um, uh, uh, what's it called, a bookkeeper who will go through and catalog all of my items, and if I don't do that, it will actually show me question marks next to a lot of these items. So it's sort of like saying like, hey, how many large shirts do we have? And someone's like, I don't know, like 20? And it might, so it might say like 20 question mark or something, and it just, it just kind of guesses because that's what the dwarves sort of think, but you don't actually know. You could be totally out, so you want to get in particular that type of dwarf to go do that particular job. Um, it's just ridiculous. Um, this is like many of the types of items. So these are the items that I have. They're stacked. So you can see like helmet snake meat five and I hit tab and I can actually like go find where this particular stuff is stored. So it's stored. Oh geez. Oh, it looks like it's stored in my, um, this is, this is a trade negotiation going on right now. Some, <laughs> some, uh, drawers have come into trade and you can negotiate with them prices and say, Oh, I'd really next year. I'm, I, we don't really have a lot of leather in this area, a lot of animals to, to murder for leather. So, uh, please bring that next time. And they will, they will bring tons and tons of leather for you or whatever it is that you might need. Um, yeah. So, um, it's a crazy game, but there is actually a lot of resources out there to help you. Um, the, uh, the, so you can get the game at bay12games.com. That's the company, more or less, that, that makes it. DwarfFortressWiki.org, total huge source of inspiration. Um, and like just everything is like, it's kind of like debugging programming, actually. It's like, why won't my dwarf go do this thing? It's like, oh, because this thing is in the way, and they don't have this labor enabled, and et cetera, et cetera. Just this, total crazy chain of stuff that you're all used to from, from programming or just debugging anything. And of course, DF stories, like I mentioned, um, to get those like crazy big um, stories. I'll close with a, um, a particular amazing bug that they found one time. Um, if I can go down to this, I'll try to make this again a little bigger. So don't worry about reading this, I'll explain it. Um, they were doing a talk at a uh, roguelike convention. These are the two guys, this is Tarn, this is Zach. And um, they added taverns recently, and so taverns are a nice place to go. Your dwarf wants to drink a lot of alcohol. Um, that's kind of their main sustenance, by the way, it's alcohol, less, less so food. Um, and they, um, so they made these taverns. Someone gets assigned to be like, you know, a barkeep or whatever. And so they go and they serve drinks. A dwarf comes in, I would like a drink. So they get a drink. They realize, oh, actually I've been commanded to go dig out this huge room or whatever. So they throw their drink on the ground. Alcohol is spilled everywhere. Kind of a bummer, but whatever that happens, it's realistic, I guess, if you have to like really run to go <laughs> to go do something. A cat comes in, there are pets in this game. Um, a cat comes in and says, oh, I'd like to be near humans, and humans all happen to be in the tavern. So I'm gonna go check that out. Um, they walk around and they get um, alcohol on their paws. And they realize, hey, this is actually a contaminant. I don't want this on my paws, so I'm gonna lick it off. And they ingest that contaminant, thus becoming drunk, vomiting everywhere all over the floor. Some died, uh, and this was not supposed to happen. They were supposed to maybe like, maybe they would become like the slightest bit inebriated, but this is drops of alcohol. This is not, you know, like hundreds of beers or something later. And they realized the bug was it in fact was thinking it was an entire beer every time they licked their paw to try to clean this up. So it just like cats died. It was a horrible epidemic and they had to fix this bug. And this is, this is a, you can see their change log and they're just hilarious. The kind of ridiculous bugs that they're finding um, to fix. And this is, a, this is a great one. But anyway, just to give you an idea of the kind of scope of the game and the kind of things that they're really thinking about to, to program in there. And uh, yeah, so thanks for coming and uh, hope you enjoyed.
if we have time for questions, I'm happy to take some. I don't know if you have to go or whatever, but. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so when they first released the game in yeah. 2006, did they release it with an API? I see that there was a. Um, they don't have, as far as I know, they don't have like an official API, but there have been people who have reverse engineered all the data files and like come up with, there's this, there's this program called DF Hack, which is more or less like the interface, that the API that someone made so to hook into the game. That you were... uh, which one? The, the one you had the graphs. The one running on the bombs. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah, that's, um, that is, yeah, this is called Legends Viewer or something. And yeah, someone, someone built it in Java. And yeah, they're just looking at like data offsets and figuring out like what doors have what and stuff. And that's all, it's all documented, although I guess it changed recently. So a lot of the documentation's out of date, but yeah. Yeah, and there's tons of crazy stuff. You can get like isometric views of your fortress where it like maps it out and shows you in 3D what it actually would look like instead of one Z layer at a time, mm -hmm. um, which is pretty cool. Yeah. What's the game written in what language? Ah, that's a great question. I don't know. I have no idea what they write in. I, I would assume kind of C++, but I don't know. Yeah. Do they, um, do they actually like care about like API extending or do they, you know? Yeah, not really. Like it's pretty much just like they're doing, gonna do what they're gonna do. And they, they're totally fine with the community packing it, but they're not like, as far as I know, they're not really officially supporting. I mean, they might answer questions here and there, but it's their, their main goal is not like make third party like, thing super easy. <laughs> like I said, people are like legitimately just going in and reading data offsets from these huge files, these binary files. Not, nah, there's no, yeah, no other way. How long does it take to generate a world with all of this? My world, so you can set the history of the world. You can have like short history, long history, medium history. And this is, I think, a medium history. It took about 10 minutes to generate all this stuff. And as you can see the events going up in real time. Um, if I think, yeah, if I go to years maybe. It sort of shows a graph. Yeah, you can see like the, the, the these are events. And you can see mm, there's a little peak here, but mostly like mostly my events are here, but it definitely goes up over time and it takes, you'll see like it'll like year one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. And it starts like really slowing down um, when it gets to like hundreds and stuff. And then so do you have to generate a world over the course of 10 minutes and then play for five minutes and die? Or do you play the same world? Yeah, so, uh, each, I mean, it depends on, I guess, how, like, how experienced you are in the game, um, but uh, you can play for, I mean, there are people who played for many years on a single, uh, on a single map, and years in game and out of game. Um, and like, I'm, <laughs> I'm uh, about, I think my current game is like one and a half years in or something like that, in game time, but I've only been playing it for a couple weeks. Mm -hmm. So you don't, you definitely don't die immediately. Like they give you some buffer to like work up your thing and you can also make it easy on yourself. Like if you go to Dwarf Fortress Wiki, they have a tutorial for first time players. They say like, look for these areas. These are good to start with. Mm -hmm. You're not going to go start on like an ice flow where there's no vegetation and no animals and anything. So, um, and like stay away from the goblin hordes. Like don't build right next to that kind of thing. If you save your game and die, can you restart? Or is it basically you die and you're done? It's meant to be more like a roguelike where you just kind of go through and you die and you're done and that's fine. And you can retire that fortress and play in the same world even if it's next door. Mm -hmm. um, but you're meant to sort of do that. You can actually use Git to version, version your uh, saves, which I do just for fun. More, more just to keep notes than anything. Just like, oh, the traders requested this last season. I need to make sure I have all that stuff ready for them kind of thing. Um, <laughs> But occasionally, like if I'm just experimenting, like I just want to go back and try this thing, or like or whatever, you know, I feel okay about that. Okay. So it depends on how true to the game you want to stick. Yeah. yeah. How long have you been playing? Me from uh, I started playing maybe a month ago, and definitely put a lot of hours into it. Like this is, but it's like every night I'll spend a couple hours. Just like the tutorial itself took me a week. Just to get through, just the first idea. You played too, right? How long have you played? Yeah. Uh, so I played for maybe two months, but it was a while ago. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I spent a lot of time on tutorials yeah. trying to work out how to get and started. Um, I ended up with a dwarf fortress whose economy was based on beekeeping. Yep. Um, which eventually a lot of people died from being stung by bees. Yep. <laughs> 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 so. Yep, that'll happen. Is My, it like Agricola? I haven't or, played that. Or what's the other one? Caverna? Um, I guess, although I think it's just far more complex. Okay. But, yeah. 
there's just a lot more systems in play. Yeah. In the sense that you're trying to make people not starve, yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. about it. Yeah, if they if like for example, if you don't have alcohol in the fortress, they'll try to find a water source and drink from that, but it, that can get stagnant and contaminated, and then people can get sick and so on and so forth. Okay. Yeah. Is it beer or do they drink liquor? Any well, you can make beer and and wine, and you can from bees, you can make yeah. mead, um, okay. and that's yeah. So there's a bunch of and there's a whole list of different types of alcohols you can make. Yeah. Mead. Mead. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I thought you said bead. Oh yeah, no mead. Which is like funny. Yeah, like honey wine. Yeah. Yeah. How do you lose the game? How do you? Mm, I, it's kind of up to you. I mean, technically, like total loss would be all your doors are dead because no one's there to do anything with. So you can't. You can't actually go say, "I'm gonna like dig this square." You have to get a dwarf to do it for you. So if they all die, you're kind of done. I guess you could maybe wait for migrants to come and like start again potentially i've never gotten that far i don't i don't know but that's how you would lose in the in the wiki actually if you if you go to the fun article it redirects to losing <laughs> yeah cool thanks everybody for coming by and checking it out thanks yeah let me know if you have questions <laughs> <laughs>